Amen. Can we give the Lord a praise offering today? All right. You can have a seat. Welcome. We're glad that you are with us. And uh, those of you watching online, it's so great to have you with us today. Uh, Ryan Chu is our um, amazing leader of uh, worship in student ministries. And uh, we're so thankful to have Ryan um, on our team now. And uh, Ryan has some announcements about some stuff that's happening this summer here in Fairfax. So take a look at this. Hi, I'm Ryan, and I'm the director of student worship, and I just have a few things I want to share with you today. So if you're new here and you want to get connected, or if you've been here for a while and you're just ready to serve or join a group, if you're watching online, you can click the button on your screen, or if you're in person, you can come to our welcome table in the lobby. Whatever it is, we're excited to have you, and we're excited to meet you. Families, Child Dedication Weekend is coming up August 14th and 15th. It's going to be a great time as we dedicate our kids at all of our services. If you haven't signed up yet, you don't want to miss out, so go do that and sign up on our website. Our teachers did an amazing job last year supporting our kids through the pandemic. We are so grateful for them. So we're launching a new project to love and support them as they go into the new school year. We really want to get everybody involved in this, so after service, head to the Love Your Neighbor area in the great room. All right, guys, that's all I have for you today. Now let's get ready to hear from Pastor Rod. All right, some cool stuff going on uh, this summer, and uh, just a few things before we, we launch into the message uh, today. One, uh, all of this, everything, everything is made possible because of your generosity to this place, and you have continued to be so, so faithful, and so thank you so much for that. And if you want to give as an act of worship today, if you're watching online, there's a little give button at the top of the screen you can click that, start the process. If you're here in the sanctuary, uh, we don't take an offering, but we have offering boxes in the back of your sanctuary. You can put your tithes and offerings there. Uh, you can give online. You can text to give. Lots of different ways that you can get involved. And speaking of giving, there, there's another way that um, you can give. Ryan was talking about uh, the challenges last year that teachers have faced and uh, we just as a church wanted to come alongside some of the teachers in our community. Our, our ethos uh, as a church, and this has been true for the last 35 years, the whole time I've, I've been here, our ethos as a church is to find people that God is using, whether, whether they have connected all the dots or not, that God is using to make a difference in the world, in our community, and to come alongside them, encourage them, resource them, build their capacity. Um, yeah, just be able to pour some fuel on the fire to to take what is already happening and just to, uh, to let that go further. And, and so that's what we do with our, with our global church plants that we started. We just find folks that God is already positioned with all of our ministries around the world, with all the things we're doing locally. And that's what we're doing this summer with teachers that are particularly teachers that are in Title I schools. We have 41 Title I schools in Fairfax County. Those are schools where uh, a lot of the students uh, are dealing with some financial challenges. Uh, a lot of them are needing free or subsidized uh, lunches just to be able to get uh, good nutrition. And, uh, and we've got a, a ton of teachers. There's a ton of folks. I'm not talking about just folks that are in our church. I'm just talking about folks in the community who are pouring their lives into those students and into those schools. And we want to come along. Here's what we want to do. This is so cool. We want to come alongside 600 teachers in our community that are in 20 of those 41 Title I schools. And we just want to love on them. We just want to encourage them. We just want to say what you do matters. We know that some of the challenges that they face are, are heightened just because of the challenges within the school. Like We just want to say you matter. We recognize what you're doing. We know how important it is. And we just want to say thanks for that. And so we're just doing something really practical uh, to do that. So here's how you can participate. As Ryan mentioned, on your way out, there's a table right in the middle of the lobby. It just has a card there that you can take. Get, you can do a bunch of cards, whatever it is that you feel like God is leading you to do. But take a card. You can write a note, just a note of encouragement to the teacher. Just tell them how much you appreciate what they're doing. And then you can purchase a gift card, $25 gift card. 
and uh, bring all that back by August 8th, and then we're going to give it to those 600 teachers. And those gift cards, they can be used for supplies, they can be used for just something special for them, whatever it is they want to use it for, that's entirely up to them. And, uh, but we want all those uh, cards to go out, we want notes to be written to all 600 of those teachers, we will provide gift cards for all 600 of those teachers, so I encourage you, on your way out, stop by the table, grab a gift card, gra- I mean grab a card, grab a bunch of cards, whatever, and uh, help us with this. The other thing I just want to say, and this also connects to kids, is that Marcy Davis has been the children's pastor here at Fairfax for almost a decade, almost 10 years. And in that role as children's pastor has poured into the life of the next generation. Literally hundreds of kids have come to Jesus under her pastoral leadership and thousands of kids have been discipled in the faith. And many of you have children that have gone through our children's ministry, maybe are presently in our children's ministry. And Marcy is going to be transitioning now out of that role. And God has some really exciting, cool stuff for her. But we just wanted to pause in kind of the midst of this transition and just give you as a congregation a chance to just say thanks to this amazing, amazing woman that has led our children's ministry for all of these Years And so right after the service, there's a little reception that's taking place over in the kids area. So please drop by, uh, tell Marcy how much you appreciate her, what she's given to this place. 10 years, I don't know, that seems like it should be a record of some sort in terms of just leadership in that kind of role. And we're just so, so thankful for Marcy. So please stop by, let her know how much you appreciate all that she's done Uh, for Fairfax. And would you just, like, while we're here, would you just celebrate her leadership? Just been fantastic. All right, so we're in week three of this eight-week series on the book of Revelation. And I know that for some of you, like, when you found out that we were doing Revelation in the summer, and it was just like, oh, man, there were some people I was going to invite to church, and now I'm not sure, and now you're going to scare them with all of this scary stuff. And we're trying to make Revelation, the book of Revelation, the book that ends Scripture, we're trying to help everyone to understand, help you to understand how practical this book is, that this book has to do with real life stuff that we deal with all of the time and God's message to us in the midst of all of the struggles and difficulties and everything that we go through in this broken world. That's not the way that it was created to be and not the way that it will be when Jesus returns. And so one of the ways to help understand that, as I've mentioned every week, is that you have to understand three things about Revelation or it won't make any sense. First, you have to understand it's a letter that it was written to a specific group of people at a specific time going through a specific set of circumstances. And in this case, it was written to seven churches located in what is now modern-day Turkey, the place, the seven churches that we're going to take a number of folks from our church. I'm going to be leading this trip in October. We're going to visit these seven churches, which is going to be a really, really cool trip. It's written to seven churches who are going through intense, intense, profound persecution. So you have to understand that it's a letter, because if you don't realize that it's a letter, then you're tempted to interpret it in a way in the 21st century that it could not have been interpreted in the first century century. And as I've said every week, scripture is the timeless, authoritative word of God, which means that it has to be relevant in every generation. It has to be relevant in every century, that you can't have portions of the, of the word of God that are irrelevant for 2,000 years and then all of a sudden become relevant because of something that's happening in the Middle East or something that's happening in the world. No, scripture is the timeless, authoritative word of God. It's relevant for every single generation. So we have to interpret it in a way that it makes sense, not only in the 21st century, but would have made sense, of course, to those who were the original audience that received. That's the first thing. Second thing you have to understand about Revelation is that you cannot read it in chronological order. You can't read it as if it's written in chronological order because if you try to do that, try to read it as a series of linear events that happen one after the other, you will be totally and completely confused. You have to look at Revelation as like a number of windows that you look through to see the same reality, but from a different perspective. 
And so the question you have to ask yourself when you read Revelation is not what happens next, it's what does John, who has received this vision from Jesus, what does John see next? What does John hear next? Because what he sees and what he hears is not necessarily something that's in chronological order to what you have heard or what he has seen or what he has heard before. That's the second thing. The third thing you have to understand, this is a part of a form of literature that is known as apocalyptic literature, which just simply means that apocalyptic literature, and that's where you get kind of the scariness, the weirdness, and all of that, because apocalyptic literature, revelation literally means apocalypse. It just means to unveil or to reveal something. So in apocalyptic literature, people are oftentimes represented as animals, and historical events are represented in the form of natural phenomena like earthquakes and and floods and all of that. Colors have meaning, numbers have meaning, all of that. And you have to understand that apocalyptic literature, the reason like for all of this imagery is because in some respects, it's like any art form, like whether it's a poem or a song or a movie or a book, whatever it is, like you don't read a poem just to learn something. You read a poem to feel something, to experience something. It doesn't just It doesn't just inform the mind, it ignites the soul. And that's what apocalyptic literature does. That's why it's written with all this imagery, because you you read this imagery, and you don't just learn something, you feel something. It ignites something within you. And that's so important when your life has been like turned upside down, and you're dealing with all kinds of stuff. You don't just need to know something, you need to feel something, you need to experience something. So those Three things are so important in understanding the book of Revelation. Last week, we looked at chapters four and five, which describe the first thing that John saw. And the first thing that John sees is this throne, this throne where all of creation, all of the cosmos, all of the universe has turned its attention to this throne and is worshiping the one that is on this throne and all of creation has turned its attention that way. And what's so important to understand about this worship scene that John is seeing is that it's not just showing us something that is going to happen out there in the future somewhere. Like Jesus is not giving this vision to these persecuted Christians whose lives are They're hanging on by a thread and they're not sure if they're gonna make it through the next day and saying, hey, don't lose hope. Out there sometime in the future, uh, all of this attention is gonna be turned to the throne and people are gonna worship that which, and all creation, the cosmos, will focus attention on the throne. No, he's saying that's the reality now. Like you can't see it because we're living in this broken, sinful world. We can't see it because you're dealing with the stuff that you're dealing with. But that's reality that's going on right now, which means that every time we worship, every time we turn our attention to the one who sits on the throne, we join with all creation who who has turned their attention to the one who sits on the throne. On the throne. We, every time we turn our attention to the one who sits on the throne, whether it's when we come together and worship or in our marriage or in our job and the stuff that we do and the relation we have, whatever it is, whenever we turn our attention to the throne, we become a part of this heavenly worship. We become a part of this intersection between the sacred, the sacred God of the universe, the the divine and and of heaven and earth, like this divine intersection that takes place. Every time we worship, that takes place. Now that's window one. It's this beautiful window of God on his throne, of all creation that's focused on him. Now we come to window two. And window two, remember I told you that you gotta look at all of these windows and realize that These windows are just different perspectives on the same reality. So window one, you look in and John sees this throne. Window two, there is the throne that is there, but there's also another perspective that you get. And the other perspective you get is all of the activity of the enemy that he is doing to cause people to not experience and not turn their focus to the one who is on the throne, to distract us, to hurt us, to cause us pain, 
all of that. You get that picture. Remember last week we left off with this vision of a scroll. And the scroll represents like the source of life, the meaning of life, the purpose of life, uh, the way that you were intended to live life before sin fractured the cosmos, you know, that before sin came into the world, like this was the way that you are to live life. This is where you find meaning in life and purpose in life. So we had this scroll and John, you remember, John was crying because no one could open the scroll. Like, man, John's like sad because this scroll is like, is like life and it represents life and meaning and purpose and no one can open the scroll and John is sad, but then someone comes along and says, no, 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 there is someone who can open the scroll. That it's the lamb that was slain. It's the lion of Judah. It's Jesus, that Jesus is worthy to open the scroll. And so it ends in chapter five with Jesus being declared as the one who can open the scroll. And what we see now in chapter six is that we see on this scroll all of these seals, and all of these seals keep the scroll closed. If you know anything about like, you know, a, a scroll that was rolled up, that there would be a seal that was placed on it, and the seal was what kept it closed. And until you opened the seal, until you took the seal off, until you broke the seal, you couldn't open the scroll to see and to read whatever it was that was inside. The image that we have here in Revelation 6 is that there's this scroll, and it has seven seals that are on it that are keeping, that are keeping people from being able to experience that which is on the scroll. And what you have in Revelation 6 is one by one, all of these seals being opened by Jesus, the one who is worthy to open the scroll. And Jesus is not, as he's opening these seals, he's not like unleashing all of this evil because all of the, as we're going to see today, all of the seals represent like horrible Stuff. He's not unleashing this evil on the world. By opening these seals, he's actually taking away their power to destroy our lives. He's taking away their power to keep us from experiencing that which is on the scroll. He's taking away the power to keep us from experiencing the life that is ours in Jesus Christ. Now, we don't have time to like read about all seven seals today, but I want to read about the first four, and then I'll summarize the other three. The first four seals are described as horses. All four are described as horses, and on each horse there's a rider. And sometimes they're referred to kind of in totality as the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and that's kind of a that's kind of been adopted within culture. There are different things that have been called before. When I was a little kid, like, like there was way, way back in the day, there were like apparently four running backs for Notre Dame that they called the four horsemen of the epoch. I don't know that they knew what it meant actually or how awful it was because they thought the running backs were really great. But anyway, they called them the four horsemen of the epoch. So it's been kind of adopted in some respects, but that's talking about these four seals in the book of Revelation. And, and what these seals are, like these are not nice horses. Like these, some of you have horses, you love horses, you ride horses, all, these are not the kind of horses that you wanna own. Like these four horses represent some of the instruments that the enemy uses to bring about like suffering and pain and death into the world. First one is the white horse. First one, it says, I watched as the lamb opened the first of the seven seals. And then I heard one of the four living creatures, remember there were, Four living creatures that were kind of circling around the throne, also giving their attention to the one on his throne. And they said in a voice like thunder, come. And I looked and there before me was a white horse and its rider held a bow and he was given a crown and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. So at first you may think that the white horse is like the same white horse that we read about in Revelation 19 that that white horse in Revelation 19 is clearly defined and described as Jesus, as the Messiah, as the Savior. But there are differences between the white horse of Revelation 6 and the white horse of Revelation 19. The rider of this white horse has a bow. The rider of the horse in Revelation 19 has a sword. The, this rider is wearing a victor's crown, a crown of a conquering general, a military figure, the writer in Revelation 19 has a crown of diadems, which is a royal crown, the crown of a king. 
This writer is bent on conquest. The writer in Revelation 19 is bent on justice. This writer, we assumed, is clothed in armor because he's going out to do battle. The writer in Revelation 19 is clothed in a white robe dipped in blood. And as you compare, you begin to realize that, that this horse and this rider are like an imitation of the white horse in Revelation 19. Like they're an imitation of the Savior, an imitation of the Messiah, an imitation, stuff that you think can save you but can't really save you. Like that's what the white horse really represents. The white horse is anything you've become convinced can save you but doesn't really have the power to save you. The white horse is the idea that if you have enough brute force, if you have enough power that, that's on your side, that you'll be safe from whatever it is. The white horse is that relationship that you've become convinced is the, the relationship that will save you. The white horse is the vocational success or the academic success or some other kind of success or accomplishment that you've become convinced will bring salvation in some way into your life. The white horse is any little comforting view of Jesus that you've created in your own image that doesn't really reflect the Jesus of the Bible. You know, we develop these little images of Jesus, these pale imitations of Jesus, and usually they come out when we say things like, well, my Jesus wouldn't do that, or my Jesus wouldn't say that, and you go, well, who's your Jesus? You know, because like Jesus is not just like this little imitation that we create in our own mind. Jesus is the Jesus of Scripture, and the Jesus of Scripture is usually more radical, more confrontational than the little Jesus that we, like the white horse is any little Jesus that we kind of construct in our own image that really doesn't reflect the Jesus of Scripture. That's what the first seal is all about. That's what the white horse is all about. Second seal is this. When the lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come. And then another horse came out, a fiery red horse. And its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make men slay each other. To him was given a, a large sword. The red horse is it's anger, it's, it's violence. It's the kind of anger and violence that, that rips families apart, that rips communities apart, that rips nations apart, that rips the world apart. It's, it's a violence and an anger that robs us of, of a sense of peace in our own lives. And, and in many ways, and I've talked about this before, our culture is like defined by the red horse. Like that defines our culture. We have this culture of anger in our country. We have this culture of anger in the world. And you see the red horse at work everywhere. You see the red horse at work in families and in the workplace and, and in our political discourse. You see the red horse at work and in our social interactions and discourse. You see the red horse at work work and in our social media posts you see the red horse at work it's just like how we relate it, it, it's become like the red horse like anger and rage has become like normative in our culture it's how we relate to it. it's how we become convinced in our culture it's the only way our voice can be heard that the only way that our voice can be heard is through anger it's through violence it's through rage that's the red horse. And it doesn't just magically disappear. Like the red horse doesn't just magically disappear even when like you let out whatever it is that you're feeling, right? Even when you string together a bunch of obscenities, even when you let someone have it, even when you get something off your chest that you've been wanting to get off your chest for a long time, you go, oh, if I could just get that off my chest, everything would be fine. No, the red horse doesn't just go away. Like you maybe feel good for a minute, that the red horse just continues to do its thing. It continues to gallop through our life. It continues to gallop through this culture. It continues to do its thing in our heart. That's the, that's the red horse. That's the second seal. And then the third seal. When the lamb opened the third seal, I heard the living creature say, come. And I looked, and there before me was a black horse. And its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. 
And then I heard what sounded like a voice from four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat, which is very small amount, for a day's wages, which is a lot, and three quarts of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil or the wine. So the black horse is like famine and hunger and food insecurity. That's what this little bit of food, this quart of wheat for a day's wages is all about. Like a little quart of wheat, you can barely feed yourself. You can't feed your family and you don't have enough resources to provide for those around you. It's like you don't have enough resources to get what you need. And here's the deal. You don't just see the black horse in places where everyone is dealing with poverty, right? You also see it in the midst of affluence. And that's what that phrase, don't damage the oil. Don't damage the wine. That's what that's all about. Because oil and wine represented affluence. It represented resources. It represented having something. See, here's the deal, is that the seven churches are going through all of their, they're they're in the midst of poverty. They are experiencing food insecurity. They're experiencing all of that, but they're not surrounded by poverty. In fact, just the opposite. They are surrounded. Think about it. They're surrounded by the affluence of the Roman empire. There has never been a more affluent empire in the history of the world than the Roman Empire. They are surrounded by all of that affluence, but because of their faith in Jesus, they have been locked out of that economic reality. They've been locked out of that economic system, and so all around them is affluence, but they're experiencing food insecurity and hunger and famine and all of that. And that's what you get with the black horse is that it's not just like in the midst of poverty. And in many ways, think about it, that's the history of the world. Like the history of the world is poverty in the midst of affluence. Like first century, second century, third century, 21st century, that's the history of the world is the black horse. The history of the world is poverty in the midst of affluence. The history of the world is tons of money, lots of money, lots of affluence. And in the midst of all of that affluence, still you have all of this poverty. We have someone on our uh, staff whose husband uh, is a PhD and works in uh, the whole field of agriculture and plant development and all this kind of stuff. He speaks for all over the world. And uh, every time I talk to him, he says, you know, the problem is not that we don't have enough. The problem is not that we don't have enough food to feed every single person in the world. We have enough. The problem is distribution. The problem is inequity. The problem is access because you have all of this poverty and hunger in the midst of all of this affluence. And you even see it in Fairfax County. I was talking about it in the announcement I made earlier. One of the most affluent counties in the nation. I think like we are the Third most affluent county in the nation. Used to be the first. Now we're the third. Wow, we've really dropped down. You know, Now we're only the third most affluent county in the nation. And yet, in the midst of all this affluence, we have 41 Title I schools where kids need assistance just to get a decent lunch. Poverty in the midst of affluence. And the black horse isn't just about physical hunger. It's also about spiritual hunger. The black horse is about famine of the soul. A black horse is about being able to stuff yourself with everything that money can buy, but still have a soul that is hungering and thirsting for something more. The black horse is gorging yourself on your accomplishments and your success, but still feeling empty inside. That's the black horse. That's the third seal. And then the fourth seal. When the lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, come, And I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death. And Hades was was following close behind him. And they were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, by plague, by the wild beasts of the earth. The pale horse is death. The pale horse is destruction. It kills and destroys. Now, here's the interesting thing. In the Greek, pale literally refers to a color. Like pale means yellowish, the yellowish green color. Like is is there anything more 
putrid than something that's just kind of yellowish green. I hope no one's wearing that today, okay? Like this pale yellowish green is kind of the sickness, is kind of the color of sickness, is kind of the, the color of, of death, right? Um, Kyle Cooper and I, Kyle, who's uh, um, one of our student pastors, uh, Kyle and I went to a restaurant recently, and I, that shall remain nameless. I, like I, I'm never going to tell you uh, what this restaurant is. So don't come up to me after the service and go, tell me what this restaurant is and what the name of it is, because I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to name it. Uh, all I will tell you is that uh, it's not in this area, so you're safe, okay? So it's not around here, so you're safe. But we went to this restaurant, and um, it was the worst meal I've ever had in my life. And I know you say, well, Rod, you're a pastor, so you like, you, you know, you're an expert in hyperbole. I'm, this is not hyperbole. Like, I've been around, I've lived for 180 years, and this is the worst meal. It's not even close. This is the worst meal that I've ever experienced. That when the food came out and the plates were set before us, I saw colors on the plate I have never in my life seen on any plate everywhere. Like there was all these different food items that I ordered off the menu. And I won't tell you what I ordered because you will never eat it again if I told you what it was. But I saw these colors that I've never seen before. Like they were supposed to be all these different. I knew what the colors were supposed to be of the items that I ordered. None of them had that color. That all of them were this kind of putrid, grayish, greenish, yellowish kind of, kind of color. And I actually started to eat it. And, and uh, Kyle said, you're not going to eat that, are you? And I said, yes, I'm going to eat it. I don't want to offend anyone. And so I started to eat. But like, I wanted to put something on it to kind of make it taste a little better. So I asked for Tabasco, which I love Tabasco. Tabasco solves everything in life. And you can put Tabasco on everything. And so I asked this really, really sweet woman who was serving us, and she was, she was genuinely sweet. I asked her for some Tabasco, and what she brought out, she brought out a bottle of Tabasco that was warm to the touch. So like, I don't know if it had been in an oven, I don't know if it had been out in the heat, I don't know where it had been, and it looked like it had been on the shelf since the beginning of the restaurant which was around the turn of the century. Not this century, the century before, okay? So this was like, and she handed it, no kidding, she handed it to me and she looked at it as she handed it to me and she said, you know, I can't tell. You know, Tabasco comes in two different colors, red and green. She, looked, she gave it to me and she goes, you know, I can't tell whether it's red or green, but here you go. And Kyle said, you're not going to put that on the food. I said, of course I'm going to put it on the food. And so I put it all over the food, and I ate most of the food. And, um, and then this lady, bless her heart. And you know what comes after bless your heart, right? So this lady, bless her heart, she, she came out, and, and I had probably set her up for this because when I came in, I wanted to make a good impression, and I said, you know what? We heard this is the best restaurant in town. And so I think she took that to heart and really was just like, okay, we are the best restaurant in town. So she came out after the Tabasco, after the food, all of that, she came out and no kidding, she had her hands in the air pumping and she said, let me hear it, let me hear it, like it's awesome, right? So let me hear it. And like I'm thinking in that moment, what do I say that's truthful but doesn't hurt her? And God, thankfully, gave me a word. And I said, it's unbelievable. <laughs> this is unbelievable. And it seemed to satisfy her. Like, she was like, yeah, let me hear it, you know. Unbelievable. Now, okay, so, okay, yes, that is not the pale horse that's not the pale horse of Revelation, even though I did, as I was eating it, wonder if the meal was going to kill me. But the pale horse of Revelation is death. It's, it's that which is sickly. It's that which brings death. The pale horse of Revelation mocks our, our medical innovations and our and the size and sophistication of our hospitals. Why? Because based on the most recent statistics, death is still undefeated. 
Like from the latest thing that I've seen, death is still undefeated. Like the only thing that we know for certain about people who were born, the billions of people that were born 150 years ago, is that they're all dead because death is undefeated. That's the pale horse. But the pale horse is more than just physical death. The pale horse is anything that robs us of life, right? The pale horse is anything that keeps us from living the kind of life that you and I have been created to live that robs us of that kind of life. The pale horse often comes in the form of missed opportunities, broken promises, unfulfilled commitments. Like that's the pale horse. That's the fourth seal. And then the final three seals, we don't have time to look at, but the fifth seal is the persecution that was experienced by those who were martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ. The sixth seal has to do with earthquakes and other natural disasters. The seventh seal is simply a, a moment of heavenly silence that takes place over the brokenness of this world. And then chapter six ends with this haunting question. Now think about this. You have this whole chapter where it's listed all of these seals that represent hurt and pain and death and loss and disappointment and discouragement. And yes, throughout the centuries, it's been more intense or less intense at different times. And yes, at different parts of the world, it's more intense or less intense. But these are the kinds of things that characterize this broken world of disappointment and pain and loss and discouragement and disillusionment and people hurting us and saying things that hurt us. And chapter six ends with this question. Who can stand? Who can stand? Like who can experience this kind of loss and this kind of pain and this kind of hurt and this kind of discouragement? Experience the pain of death and people that we love? Like who can experience all of that and it not destroy them? That's the question of chapter six. And chapter seven answers the question and we can, of course, today read everything that's said in chapter seven. But let me just read this. After this, John says, I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. From every nation, every tribe, every people, every language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. That's us. That's you. That's everyone who has turned their attention to the throne. And they were wearing white robes and they were holding palm branches in their hands. Sound familiar? And they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell down on their faces before the throne and they worshiped God saying, amen, praise, glory, wisdom, thanks, honor, and power, and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Who can stand? Revelation says you can stand. That's who can stand. Who can who can experience loss and difficulty and pain and, and somehow not be destroyed by it? Revelation says, you can. You can stand. Those who have turned their eyes to the throne, those who are worshiping the one who is on the throne, those who are worshiping the one who has Open the seal. Those who are worshiping the one who has died for us on the cross and taken on all of that death and all of that pain and all of that suffering and all of that disappointment and all of that sin and has taken it upon his shoulders so that we might stand, so that we might live, so that we might, even in the midst of this broken, sinful world, so that we might Thrive. I love the way Eugene Peterson puts it. He says this, these people talking about us are not only secure, they're exuberant. This cure, there is this curious but holy biblical phenomenon that's going on. The most frightening presentation of evil, Revelation 6, is set alongside extravagant praise, Revelation 7. 
Christians, I love this, Christians sing. They sing in the desert, they sing in the night, they sing in the prison, they sing in the storm, and evil, no matter how fearsome, is exposed as weak and pedantic before such songs. Jesus' message, yes, Jesus' message to the seven churches and his message to you is nothing can steal your song. That nothing can steal your song. Those who follow Jesus, they just keep singing. You can't shut them up. They just sing. They sing in the face of the four horsemen. They sing in the face of hardship and persecution. They sing in the face of evil. No matter what happens, they just keep singing. And we've seen this throughout the 2,000-year history of the church, of people who love Jesus, people whose attention was turned to the throne, who have faced oppression, who have faced persecution, who have been enslaved, and they continue to sing. They write songs of rejoicing and singing and praise. You cannot shut those who follow Jesus up. Think about Paul and Silas in the prison at midnight, having been beaten, and what do they do? They sing, because that's what Christians do. That's what those who follow Jesus do. They sing. That's what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 24 when he says this. And this gospel of the kingdom, no matter what happens, no matter these, all of these seals, no matter all of the stuff that goes on in this broken, sinful world, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. That's a promise, folks. Jesus is saying that in spite of the enemy's best shot, this kingdom is just going to keep advancing. Nothing can stop the kingdom from advancing. It's just going to keep advancing until Jesus returns. Think about this. What government? There's been all of these awful, evil governments in the history of the world. What government has stopped the kingdom from advancing. What army? There's been all of these powerful armies that have come and gone in the history of the world. What army has stopped the kingdom from advancing? What plague, what pandemic has stopped the kingdom from advancing? What persecution, what hardship, what difficulty has stopped the kingdom from advancing? All those awful things all those awful things have happened over and over and over again. And yet, here we are, 2,000 years later, Fairfax, Virginia, and we are still singing. We are still singing because nothing can stop the advance of the kingdom. We are singing because God is making all things new. We are singing because God is restoring all things and redeeming all things and transforming all things, including us. We are singing because Jesus is worthy. He's worthy to open the scroll. He's worthy to receive glory and honor and praise. We get to end this service, as we do every week, by singing, right? Singing about the worthiness of the Lord. And I know that some of you, because of the, because of the, the horses that you have experienced, because of the, the pain, the hurt, the loss that maybe you are experiencing even right now, I know that some of you don't feel like singing. Like that's, that's what, all of these things that the enemy throws at us, that's what the enemy wants to do. The enemy wants to steal our song. And I know that some of you probably are like, I don't feel like singing. I've experienced this. I'm in the midst of this. I'm struggling with this. I'm dealing with this. I'm dealing with this relationship. I'm dealing with this loss. I'm dealing with this pain. Whatever it is, I don't feel like singing. I know, but do not let any of that steal your song. You have a song to sing. You have a song to sing, so sing. Sing in the face of pain. Sing in the face of evil. Sing in the face of loss. Sing in the face of death. Sing in the face of disappointment and disillusionment. Sing, because Jesus is worthy. 
He is worthy of our praise. He is worthy and God will hear your song. He will hear your song. He will honor your song. Your song, your song in the midst of your pain will bring glory and honor to him. So sing, sing. God, we are so thankful for what you have done for us on the cross. We're so thankful that no matter what the enemy throws at us, that it cannot steal our song because you have taken all of that. All of those seals were part of what you took upon your shoulders as you died for us on the cross. And so Lord, today we sing. We sing because you are worthy. You're worthy to open the scroll. You are worthy to bring life and wholeness. You are the only one who is worthy. And so we sing. In the name of Christ, amen. This song, this song that we're gonna sing, it, it, uh, it asks a simple question. Is he worthy? Is Jesus worthy? And we have the opportunity to proclaim that indeed, that indeed, Jesus is worthy. So let's sing to the Lord today. Let's stand.